go in there. To... Although Christian Emmons is going to make a meme out of it, and I don't need that. No, he won't. He's a nice guy. Oh man, I am sweating. That spider was so big. <laughs> Holy shit! I thought you I thought you had all these cats to kill all these creatures inside your uh, apartment. Uh, apparently, well, Muffins took care of the one the other night. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, all right, here we go. So he like took the week off now. Yeah. <laughs> I need to turn this this way because uh, I am in a mood and Steak and Shake forgot my fucking fries <gasps> and I wrote on their wall that I am unhappy about it. I really do like their, their fries. I know. Was it cheese sauce? I paid for fucking fries and I didn't get them. Mm. And I'm mad and I wrote, I just wrote on their wall, you did not provide me with my fries, unacceptable. Unacceptable! <laughs> it's like fucking Cartman. <laughs> All right, ready? Lacey did that one time to like White Castle on Twitter, and they sent her like a bunch of free stuff for like a White Castle burger. <laughs> Honestly, uh, so my ex used to do that. She used to go troll on all these like you know White Castles wall or whatever, and like these people like genuinely are pissed uh -huh. and write the funniest shit. It is great entertainment if you go look at a restaurant's Facebook page. All right. It's really Ready? cool when they... Uh-oh. I think that sent it as the wrong one. So who else, you, you know, oops, sent that. You better figure that out. Oops. I did. Don't worry. I said, <laughs> but I'm not... I, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go. Well, Christy already commented on it. <clears throat> Harry? <laughs> You're welcome. I see what's happening here. Would you let me start, please? Hey, oh, sorry. Welcome to... Oh, wow. Woo, hello. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. Think of us as the love child of National Review and Mad Magazine. We explain to you what the hell is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. This is not the right intro. Ugh. Sorry, sorry, everybody. Turn the beat around. <laughs> now for your entertainment, <laughs> Black Harry. With... <laughs> Here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I am your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. We explain to you what is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Essentially, we make you sound smarter when talking to your friends. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, and subscribe at Patreon on, at WeAreLibertarians.com. In exchange for supporting our program, we give you all kinds of bonus content and freebies. We're always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at WeAreLibertarians.com. If you are new to the program, we catch up for the first 20 minutes or so and then de dive deep into analyzing current events in society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned. The language is strong and offensive. Now, uh, I need to delete that 20 minutes thing because that's not the case for the Tuesday show when uh, Harry and I get together and we start reviewing the news. And we have two shows a week. The first episode airs Wednesday for most people, Tuesday night for our subscribers on Patreon, and, and even sooner for everybody in the uh, exclusive Dear Leader chat, Dear Leader's Court, for those who donate $10 a month. We appreciate you guys so much. And uh, they're watching right now, commenting, and they get to hear the show, commercial-free, high-quality audio, on Wednesday. And that episode on on tu yeah on Wednesday, on Tuesday night, I'm a mess. We'll explain why in a second. And uh, th that is when Harry Price and I get together and we review some of the top stories of the week, give you a quick libertarian perspective, catch you up on all the news of what's happening in the world. And my co-host is Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good. Going good. You had to, you know, still a little rattled from the uh, intruder that we had earlier. I uh, I was a viciously attacked. <laughs> I have personally lived through a traumatic situation. An assassination. Uh, it okay. was an assassination attempt by the creature world, <laughs> uh, a giant spider, like the size of a cat, mm -hmm. crawled across my chest right above my heart on my shirt. I freaked out. It's on, oh, thank God it's on live camera. Uh, if you're in the Dear Leaders Court, you can see the video, but we'll, we always post that onto your YouTube channel later, so you can go back and watch the archive version of me screaming like a two-year-old girl, as uh, or boy. We're not we're gender fluid here. Yeah, gender fluid, you know, it, and all those in between. 
And uh, I, I panicked, and then it came back for round two, yep. and Harry helped me defeat the giant spider that was trying to take Deer Leader down. Yep. Oh, yeah. And uh, another thing with the intro, you have the whole 20 minutes thing. If we did 20 minutes, that would cut a lot of part, part of our time of this quick hour that we're trying to get through. Well, I mean, the thing with the, with the Tuesday show is that the Tuesday show is quick, quick, quick. And we're really going back to the old format from the early days of We Are Libertarians where Chris Galt, Creighton Harrington, and I would sit down and do three to four stories in an hour mm -hmm. and then get out. Yeah. And then over time, the Thursday show, we recorded an episode Thursday night where my co-hosts are Greg Lenz and Kat and Agnos, and uh, then that airs Friday morning, Thursday night for everybody who's part of the Patreon subscription service. Uh, they That show has evolved into a single subject, deep dive into a single issue with you know comedic tantrums throughout. And when our Patreon goal hit 500, one of the goals was to do a second show. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't, I, I have to be honest, our, our stats have taken a hit. And so I don't know if that, what that means, if people are pissed that there's an extra hour a week. Anecdotally, I've not heard that. Yeah. The stats look down, but I think that's just a function of having, you know, more content. But, uh, so I'm, I'm really curious to hear what you guys think. If, uh, you, you guys think that this works. I'm not doubting it. I, I I've wanted to do a second show forever because I think there's so many different topics through the week that we don't get to cover now mm -hmm. because we just the nature of that Thursday show has changed. And so I wanted to add another show where we we gave you just talking points. Like we're going to talk a little bit about Rand Paul tonight. We're going to talk about um, the, the the Trump's <laughs> lawyers. The Trump's <laughs> lawyers. This is the most Trump thing ever. If you don't know, we we won't spoil it for you. Um, my my list won't won't come up. What else are we talking about, Harry? Tonight, I'm I'm having a I just day. Clicked off the other thing. Uh, we also got the uh, whole Facebook and ads. Yeah, Facebook <coughs> selling Russian ads apparently, uh, which is a non-story in our opinion, and we'll explain why. Yep. So, you know, these are some of the basic stories that we just don't get to cover on the Thursday show anymore. And you guys have asked for a second show, so here it is. Yeah. So, uh, and then in the bonus segment for our Patreon subscribers. Um, Harry, you you've been given a lot of love at the at the live show on Monday night. Yep. You oh, yeah. you were told uh, this this awesome couple. I wish I remembered their names. It was Larry and I didn't get to feed his wife. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now when I when I cough and turn my mic off, I need you to talk so there's no silence there. That's how radio works, Harry. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something when I said this. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm I, I'm I'm like trying not to cough to death here. Um, this is this is live to tape. Like we don't go back and edit the podcasts anymore. Anymore. I used to spend an, two hours for every hour of broadcast time, but we don't do that anymore. We want it to be as live as yeah. as possible. And, and raw, yeah. Because back in the classic wall episodes, yeah, you used to edit out the swear the, words, the ums and everything. Um, yeah, in the day. Space inside the radio, but yeah. So we're gonna. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so Mary came up from came up from to Kentucky. Um, hopefully, two, two yeah. and a half hour drive up yeah, to see us. Up to see us uh, and uh, hand me a sticker. I don't have the sticker on my laptop yet because I don't exactly know where I want to put it on my cascade of stickers here on my uh, uh, Lenovo. Uh, so I just got to figure out where I want to put it. Now, and I they figured out yet. So. And they raved about you and loved mm -hmm. that you have uh, a permanent co-hosting spot. Yep. And uh, that, and you're you're Larry's favorite. Yes. <laughs> and and there are a couple activity is to sit on the porch and smoke and drink and listen to We Are Libertarians, yeah. which like is weird for me because this is like I don't know we're so incited. Yeah. That like to think that the we're somebody's hobby is weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> to me, yeah, well, see, like I, I do the same thing. Like um, Lacey and I will sit out on the front porch and uh, we'll grill out and burn wood and we'll listen. And well, I listen to podcasts when I'm sitting out there. Uh, she mostly likes them. I listen to a podcast that is it's a bunch of DJs and they DJ, it's a DJ podcast if that makes any sense. Where they come together and instead of talking and bring topics, they just bring mixes. And yeah, they, like Tiesto's life. Tiesto's life. Yeah, uh, I, listen to, uh, I listen to Communion After Dark radio. It's I like here, I like that Florida. you don't know one of the most famous working DJs uh, on the planet right now. But then you're like, like yeah, this, I'm really into the DJ game. But and so then I, it's a uh, goth industrial music, right? Of course it is. That's <laughs> who I listen to. <laughs> uh, I want to say thanks to one of our subscribers, uh, I, Joshua Sexton. I think it's Joshua that sent these. 
Uh, so I came home on my birthday and uh, to a present of 500 business cards that are – it just says, Chris Bangle, dear leader, generous and thorough in big white type. Uh, it's up beautiful. on the it's up on the Instagram. They are they're very beautiful, and he's he went all out. He got the the glossy coating. I mean, Ooh. you're the first person I've given one to. Um, but oh, when I go to a right. college campus, I will be handing these out left and right. So um, when when we head up to Muncie, mm -hmm. look out, cats roommates, you're getting a generous and thorough card. <laughs> 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 it's going to be very funny. Let's jump into the show here. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. Uh, we want to start with Rand Paul. Rand Paul is making a comeback. Uh, he didn't really go away for most of us libertarians, but for the press, they are rediscovering Rand Paul mm -hmm. because he's standing up to the evils of Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah. So, now and, he's safe. <laughs> right. So September 11th, uh, they were amazingly, it was September 11th into the 13th, they were debating the uh, defense author National Defense Authorization Act. This comes up every year. It is uh, the act that funds the military every year. And he was trying to uh, put in an amendment that would have given a six-month sunset to the authorizations for use of military force that were passed on September 14, 2001, and again in 2002 in the run-up to the Iraq War. And essentially what this, uh, this provision did, uh, it it allowed the president to have unlimited funds to conduct war. As Rand Paul points out, we're at war in seven different places, and we've declared war in none of them, as the Constitution says. And his amendment ended up failing um, 61 to 36 to kill the amendment in the Senate. Uh, that that would have uh, it it wouldn't have stopped the wars, but it would have forced the unending blank check for the for the uh, National Defense Department. And uh, I want to play a little bit the beginning of Rand Paul's speech here, uh, and just so you can get a taste of exactly what he was saying that night as he was uh, trying to extend it. He uh, held up debate and tried to do another filibuster. Sorry, something fell. Uh, so this is the beginning of his speech as he started that AUMF uh, amendment. Time in 15 years... We are debating the congressional role in the declaration of war. We have fought the longest war in U.S. history under an original authorization to go after the people who attacked us on 9-11. That war is long since over. The war has long since lost its purpose. And it's long time that we have a debate in Congress about whether we should be at war or not. It is the constitutional role of Congress. Interestingly, the folks that you have heard on either side of the issue have said it is our job. It is what we should be doing. And yet we haven't done it for 16 years. Who in their right mind thinks that Congress is actually going to do their job without being forced to do their job? My resolution is actually silent on whether we should still be at war. My resolution just simply says that the resolutions that we have previously passed will expire. I don't believe they have anything to do with the seven wars we're involved with currently anyway. But if we were to force them to expire, we would then have a debate. But for those who say, yes, Congress should exert its authority, Congress should be involved in the initiation of war, they don't really believe that unless they're going to vote that way. What will happen is the continuation of the same that we abdicate that role and let the president do whatever he wants. It's worse than that. Let's say we were to vote for my resolution and that the authorization to go to war after 9-11 expired. Do you think any of the wars would end? No, the neoconservatives and the neoliberals believe the president has unlimited authority. They call it Article II authority for war. There is some authority given to the president. It's an enormous amount of authority to execute the war but not to initiate war. The sole duty of initiation of war was given specifically to Congress. So if these authorities were to expire, the president already says, I have all the authority I want under the Constitution to do whatever I want. But that's not what our founders wanted. 
Madison, if he were here, would vehemently disagree. Madison wrote that the executive branch is the branch most prone for war. Therefore, the Constitution, with studied care, vested that power in the legislature. It was supposed to be difficult to go to war. And some gnash their hands and say, oh, Senate could never agree on any authorization to go to war. You know how long it took us after Pearl Harbor? 24 hours and we declared war on Japan. You know how long it took us after 9-11? Three days. We can come together as a body when we're attacked, when we're unified in purpose. But guess what? After 16 years, it's difficult to determine the purpose in Afghanistan. But also those who say, oh, we need a new authorization, but it's going to authorize war anywhere, anytime, with no geographic limit or no time limit. Basically, they would be authorizing everything we're doing now and not putting any limitations on it. So that is Senator Rand Paul as he was trying to force debate on his uh, amendment to end the uh, <clears throat> the uh, authorization on use of military force. And uh, he really spoke very eloquently. So I wanted to play his words because he made the case better than I think Harry or I could at this point. Uh, and, and you really, go ahead. at that moment, you could really feel like a lot of, he, he's probably struggled, he's going to struggle his entire career to get out of the shadow of his father, but you almost can feel that same like breath of, you know, not caring what everyone else, yeah. you know, thinks about him and, and says it and comes out and says exactly what people supposed to read in the side. Like the he, ga he gave the presidency a shot, it didn't work out, and now he's ready to pick up the mantle that his dad left off. Yeah. And that has always been my criticism of Rand Paul. Yes, he had the filibuster way back in 2013 when he filibustered uh, presidential power to unilaterally kill American citizens. And that was a moment when we all cheered and, you know, we did right. an entire episode on that. Um, but he then started to become a little wishy-washy about a lot of stuff over the course of the next few years as he prepared to run for president in 2016. And in in some of the things that he's doing lately, it really seems like he is now standing up for the principles that we all kind of knew were lurking behind the scenes with Rand Paul. But now he's uh, he's grown some balls. And that's really what I've wanted out of Rand Paul was to stand up and be like Justin Amash mm -hmm. or Thomas Massey, who are congressmen from – uh, Michigan and, and Kentucky, respectively, uh, and just say the hard things because when you do that, you get more respect. Yes. It was almost like he thought he was he was running for president, like he knew he was going to make that run, and every consultant was telling him, like, hey, be careful on that difference, uh, um, on that hard line stuff because you're going to lose some of the base. Right. And trying to basically just trying to listen to consultants so he could make a successful presidential run. Yeah. Which, if he would have stayed hard, stay what he would have done, he probably would have did better. Yeah. I, I totally agree because he would have brought in a lot of people from every spectrum, much like Trump did. But I think it, it, 2016 was just a bad year for him to run in hindsight. I mean, right. I think they thought that he would end up picking up everything that his dad had built over two cycles, and Donald Trump did. You know, Donald Correct. Trump – as Greg points out all the time, Donald Trump, if you go and look at Missouri, for instance, uh, Do Donald Trump – or no, it was Iowa. If you look at Iowa, uh, Donald Trump picked up all of the Ron Paul counties, and Rand well, Paul did not in yeah, Iowa. Yeah, well, because a lot of the people who were Ron Paul supporters in Iowa, if they were still voting – if you're still voting, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because they're either anarchists now and they don't vote anymore, but a lot of them, they're not uh, also that time – Iowa has did their best. Iowa and Republicans did their best to outs and kick out most of those Ron Paul yeah. uh, Republicans out of the out of their out of the party and out of positions of power, including Amash, including Massey, and including Ron, uh, Ryan, Rand Paul. And I think the other part of this that factors into this is that Rand uh, is in a safe Senate seat now in Kentucky. It has it has moved redder mm -hmm. <laughs> if that was possible. And Rand Paul has more of a safety. He won re-election in 2016 pretty handily. Matt Bevin was elected president, somebody who was or a president, a governor of the state of Kentucky. Matt Bevin is a, uh, a Tea Party uh, darling, somebody that Glenn Beck really liked or likes, and won there and was a pretty controversial candidate and now a controversial governor in Kentucky. So I think... Paul feels a little bit more secure in his seat, a little bit more secure in his message, and doesn't have the risks that he had. 
And I'm really excited for this Rand Paul because this is the Rand Paul that I wanted. And and long-time listeners to the show know that I have always been critical of both Pauls because, first off, I hate a cult of personality. Like, to me, we are to be about the rule of law. We are, about to, we are to be about principles. We are not to be about the shiny new toy right. in the people that, like, that's a, a lot of why I don't really follow Larry Sharp. It's not that I don't like Larry Sharp. It's just that Larry Sharp is the new black libertarian Jesus, mm-hmm. and everybody's fawning over him, and then that sucks all the air out of the room, and it just becomes this cult of personality. And I, I just kind of don't care. Like, there's a lot of other other candidates out there. You know, when Ron Paul was running, Ron Paul sucked up all the resources in the libertarian movement for his presidential races, and he was never going to win the nomination. Uh, and it sucked up a lot of resources from a lot of candidates that could have won election, like in these lower races. And the funny thing that all these Republic Liberty Republican Caucus people. Republican Liberty Caucus, where well, the libertarians should just stick to down ballot races and county races, and you're exactly right. Yeah. But it's hard when you guys suck up all the money for your little pet projects. I mean, mm-hmm. now listen, I'm a Libertarian Party person because I believe in a third party. Okay. Okay. But I also t- completely understand the argument that the Republican Party automatically gets 45 percent, or what you argue, Harry, which is there's no reason to vote. Don't encourage them. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> mock the system, stay out of it. Exactly right. I t- yeah. I completely understand, and I am party agnostic. Yeah. Uh, and and obviously Rand Paul is in the Senate, and a libertarian is not, and that's great. Yeah. Uh, but I think we all have to be careful about not making these people into libertarian saviors, and and keeping them accountable. Mm-hmm. That their base will hold them accountable, and you need to fight for the issues that we care about. And it's great to see Rand Paul finally doing that. Correct, yeah. Because, yeah, Ron did as great as Ron was and brought a lot of people into the Liberty Movement. Each presidential run, he took volunteers from states that the Libertarian Party could have used yeah. to one, get ballot access. So, like, most of the people's biggest complaint about the Libertarian Party is that they don't have ballot access. Well, for, you know, eight years, Ron Paul kept sucking up resources and volunteers to you know, run on the rep- Republican ticket. So they had four years to rebuild for Gary and then, you know, and then another four years. So Right. It's, it's, it is what it is. And do I, a lot of people is like, well, uh, you're an anarchist, what do you care? What do you care about the system? Yes, I do mock the system. And I do go in there and cast a, what people would call a vote. I mostly just kind of go in and check a box on for a political party that I know a lot of people have worked very, very hard mm-hmm. and have used to get the liberty mes- message out there and to allow other people to even just question and allow that on the ballot. So I do go in there and I do cast a vote for the Libertarian Party in here in Indiana just for the simple fact that it puts that on it puts that on the ballot so if someone else who's 18 believes in the system they at least can see another way there's another option out there for them. sure yeah. yeah you care about giving voters options and I yeah. totally respect that and I appreciate that and like I'm I just I believe libertarians should respect everybody's uh, efforts mm-hmm. and that's been my biggest frustration over 10 years in the libertarian movement is that People who are in the Republican Liberty Caucus or in the Libertarian Party or anarchists who aren't a part of the system or whatever just want to trash somebody else's efforts. Like, I'm only willing to trash people who talk a big game on Facebook but don't do shit. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That, those are the people that I don't like. But if you're, if you're a, a Rand Paul Republican working mm-hmm. to reform the Republican Party, you have as good of a shot as the Libertarian candidates do in November. Like, the yep. thing about running as a Republican is you lose the primary, mm-hmm. and so you're just done, and you don't get those other months when people are more tuned in to the message. Mm-hmm. And that's why I prefer the Libertarian Party, because you have those extra months Correct. to to preach the Libertarian message as a candidate. But if you make the, a different decision than I do, that's cool. Just don't shit on me when I make a different decision than you. Yeah, and myself, I am not an LP member, not a part of the LPIN um, or National Party, and I even, as not a member, I get annoyed of non-members being annoyed at the LP. Right. I'm like, or like, right, if you care so much, then join. Change it from the inside. No, yeah. I ain't going to do that. I was like, then go become an anarchist if you don't believe you can change the system from the inside. Yeah, I just have, <laughs> I have no tolerance, and I was on a Facebook jihad this week over people who 
who sit there and go, well, I'll join the Libertarian Party when X, Y, and Z happens. It's yeah. like, okay, well, you're not willing to actually do anything. Well, it's just uh, it's just not worth my time because nothing ever gets done. It's like, mm -hmm. well, like one person, it was funny. He was like, well, I just I just don't get involved because I just don't think that it's worth my effort. Yep. And I said, well, I just don't see any consistent goals for the state party. And I said, well, we do have consistent goals. We just don't publish those on Facebook because it's a private organization. Funny you should mention that, though, Doug, Doug Carr, who we've had on the show. One of the goals is to hire a digital marketer to help us build out some better platforms, and mm -hmm. you are a person that of interest in, <laughs> in bringing them in, and mm -hmm. we've been courting Doug to bring him in to help him with some of this stuff, not just to have him do it for free, but to hire him and pay him money. Right. Because I'm a big believer, and I'm really pushing our state party to spend money on professionals. If you, we're burning volunteers out do, with amateurs doing amateur level work when we've got money in the bank to hire a professional to do it. Right. It's crazy that it's supposed to be the party of fiscal economics and new all this stuff economics tries to be all socialist and communist by trying to run with amateur free volunteers. Right. It's nuts. It's crazy that they're like, well, we need this for free. Or they'll try to pay peanuts. Like, well, you're going to get peanut work. Right. You know, if you want good techs, you want good SEO people, you have to pay good money for it. Yeah. You know? It's, well, we, we only have X amount of dollars. Well, if you, you start... You need If you have a need uh -huh. and you tell people you have a need mm -hmm. not only do they fund that need they also go oh wow they're doing something correct let's yeah. give them money same way with the free state project they raised money and then advertised it paid a the, the only way the free state project got up to twenty thousand is because they went out and paid a marketer they got someone who was do, who did it for who does it for a living and they got twenty thousand yeah yeah before that they were just struggling struggling to get it up they're struggling to get there's just like and they finally went and got a paid marketer yeah so uh i it, just it works it's it's like the people who believe that there shouldn't be a floor fee for the convention it's like oh. well listen there ain't no such thing as a free lunch if somebody if you were getting some value as a just a regular person out there and you were going in and casting a ballot Right. And you are a libertarian party voter mm -hmm. somebody is carrying the load in terms of money or effort and if if you don't have time, then maybe give money. And if you don't have money, then give a Facebook share, or whatever. Help, pr you know, just help promote something. That's that's what we ask here. Like, yeah. the reason we have a subscription service is it costs me about five hundred dollars a month at least to run this. Mm -hmm. There's another several thousand dollars a month worth of things that I would like to do for this new media outlet. Yeah. And so I can't carry that load. So I bet if I ask our listeners, hey, will you pitch in? You get this podcast for free. I don't want to charge you a bunch of money for the podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put it behind a paywall. I don't want to – and, you know, we don't have advertisers per se. What I do with the ad blocks at the beginning of the show for the feed, mm -hmm. those are my friends who have podcasts that I think are really good that I want you to listen to those shows. Yes. You know, like I'm trying to help give pay it forward to other libertarian podcasters mm -hmm. as they build their thing too because so many people help me. Uh, now we do have sponsorship, you know. If you want to sponsor, we we do uh, do that. But um, it's just not something that I want to. I, I I think there's enough people in our audience to help pay for this stuff, and it it's and it's worked. Like we're up at a thousand dollars a month, which is amazing. Wow. Like I can't believe we've hit a thousand dollars a month in Patreon donations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And like that, it's just it's humbling and amazing that we've built a product. That people enjoy in this pot in these two podcasts, your you know the Tuesday yeah. show and the Thursday show, and uh, th th like the national convention, it cost a tremendous amount of money to put on a national convention. Yes, and they don't force every voting member to pay. About twenty five percent of the people come in and vote, never pay a dime. Well, the AV costs seventy five thousand dollars because that's what the hotel cartel is charging correct yeah. <laughs> it's sixty five thousand dollars i think it's a, it's a tourist town so yeah for four days of av in, in new orleans you know and well it shouldn't cost that it's like well yeah it shouldn't cost that but it does and they're the only provider so this is what we got to pay yeah correct yeah so it was like that in indianapolis for the longest time until other companies started jumping up exactly right and so there's going to be 25% of the Libertarian Party that meets in New Orleans in the spring, and they're not going to pay a dime, and that just gets offset and pushed off to the other 75%, and then the price goes up, and so people go, I'm not going to go to the convention and participate because it's too expensive. Yeah. 
or I'm just going to go and not pay, and then that number creeps up to 26, 27, 29. You know, it's libertarians are don't understand economics in their own private organization sometimes. So, anyways, we're off way off yeah, on a way tangent, off, way, but yeah, yeah, super off. Yeah. <laughs> we're way off, but uh, so, but I I just think it's great that Rand Paul is starting to um, bring bring the stuff back around. You know, he he's bringing up issues that libertarians care about, especially about the national security state. Uh, they tried to hide the amendment and not have any discussion on his event amendment to end the authorization on use of military force, which was basically passed three days after 9-11. And they said, here's a blank check to fight the war on terror. And then it was reauthorized in 2002, right before the Iraq war. And that has been the funding source. These two uh, authorizations have been the funding source for the war on terror. And as we talked about last time, that's an enormous amount of money that has drastically changed a lot of things in our foreign policy and in our country. What Rand Paul is saying is, let's have a discussion about where that money is going, how that money is being used. Do we want to continue the war in Afghanistan? Do we need to continue a war in six other countries? What are the reasons we are fighting in Afghanistan? And I don't think that he is uh, trying to do anything that is uh, – crazy and he wrote in an op-ed in on september 11th in rare r-a-r-e yeah. these authorizations to use military force are inappropriately being used to justify american warfare in seven different countries sunsetting both aumfs will force a debate on whether we continue the afghan war the libya war the yemen war the syria war and other interventions if we don't get this rudderless foreign policy under control now we'll be still asking the same questions another 16 years down the road Repealing the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs would restore respect for the balance of power and reassert Congress's voice by forcing legislators to specifically approve or disapprove the direction of our foreign policy. If my provision passes, the authorizations would sunset six months later, allowing Congress time for a thorough debate about how we will move forward. Let's utilize the same focus and discipline we expect of our military to give them specific authorization as each unique situation warrants. My amendment would give the U.S. Senate that chance because Syria, Libya, Yemen have come over the last few years, and we just roll that into the AUMFs, and they just keep getting funding. So he is uh, he is uh, out there doing a lot of good work on this. And trying to get the power of the purse back to Congress. Exactly right. He also is leading the the, <laughs> the spiritual battle, I would say, for the Republican Party – when it comes to Obamacare, and he was a holdout on the Trump Care bill and basically said, no, we promised our base and the American people that if uh, we had the House, the Senate, and the, the presidency, we would repeal and replace. I would prefer to repeal, but we're not going to get to replace until we repeal, and then we can replace. And he, is, he has forced the hand of the Senate and the president and has been one of those people who was uh, really pushing, uh, and along with Senator uh, Murkowski and uh, several others, including John McCain, bringing down that Trump care vote. And now he is leading the fight again as essentially over the next month is incredibly important for the uh, for the health care debate. So they go into recess around the 1st of November, and then they go home for Christmas, and then they come back a little bit early in the year, but for the most part, they're gone next year for midterm elections. There's like 18 Senate seats that are up next year, mm -hmm. and they're all kind of Republican-leaning, and they have the chance to have a really big majority in the Senate if they do this right. Yeah. But that's not going to happen if they fall flat on their promise of repealing and replacing Obamacare, mm -hmm. something that they have promised and promised and promised and promised and have failed at this point and it is going to be something that the base is going to revolt in the Republican party against yeah. and Rand Paul is saying no I don't care what's politically possible we need to do this right now so senator lindsey graham who's a real piece of shit <laughs> to put it mildly is somebody that Libertarians disagree with Lindsey Graham and John McCain on just about everything, uh, it seems. And anytime there is a really bad piece of legislation, John McCain and Lindsey Graham seem to love it. And so Lindsey Graham and Bill Cassidy, a Republican from Louisiana, have come up with a bill that would repeal Obamacare's individual mandate 
and convert it into a system of state-administered block grants, and it appears to be gaining momentum. So essentially what that means is they're going to get rid of the individual mandate. The individual mandate says that every American must own health insurance, and it was the first time that a product has been forced into the pocketbook of the American people. It was bizarrely upheld by the Supreme Court when Judge uh, Roberts, the, the Chief Justice John Roberts, uh, voted to keep it, <laughs> and uh, uh, just a complete twisting yes. of the Commerce Clause. And uh, Senator Mike Lee wrote a great book called Why John Roberts is Wrong About uh, Health Care, I think it was, Obamacare mm -hmm. maybe. But if you look up uh, his, his bibliography, you'll see a book on, on Judge Roberts, and uh, it's, it outlines and picks apart uh, that particular Supreme Court ruling. And uh, the, But the individual mandate, we oppose, as libertarians, we oppose that completely because that forces us to buy a product. Correct. Well, it's not, yeah, it forces you to buy a product, and if you don't, you get penalized if you don't buy that product. So that's also bad. So you get, a, it's a tax on living. So it's, it's, it's a double whammy bad. It, it's, and it's not for something that you can elect into or something you can't do because you're alive. You have to take that. You have to get the health insurance. Now, granted, should you, most people have it? Yeah, but you shouldn't be forced into doing something. It's a voluntary. It should be a voluntary system. No force necessary. And it's, it's crazy that it's that way. Yeah, and so yeah. and it, and they keep using the comments. They use the comments. The comments. The comments clause, <laughs> which we don't like. Commerce, comments. The commerce clause for every little thing, for every interstate thing, they try to use that same clause right. to, to push through every freaking agenda. So what they want to do is they want to repeal that, which you have to have the individual mandate for Obamacare to work because you're forcing people into paying for, you know, when they say, well, 26 million people will lose their health insurance. No, 26 million people will have the freedom to choose to not buy health insurance because Correct. that doesn't fit for them. Correct. They're and not going having, to. They're, know, they're not going to lose their health insurance. They're just not going to buy something they don't need. Right, and they could buy something that they want, right. or buy something you because most uh, most men between eighteen and thirty five do not buy health insurance. We buy yeah. car parts. We want car parts. Okay? Right. <laughs> you know, a tur we want a good turbo, which is going to cost about five thousand dollars or up. You know, for their cars. Or and we, we buy cats. And, <laughs> But turbo, <laughs> or For podcast. As much equipment. as you spend on this, you could have had a nice turbo in your Chrysler. I don't need uh, a turbo in any car. <laughs> Honestly, I got I got I got pulled over doing felonious speeds. I don't need a turbo. <laughs> so like, but like in those times, like most men, you know, we got we're pumped full of testosterone, high T, you know, and we feel like we don't need a health insurance, or we get some crappy health insurance that'll just happen because we wrecked a car with the turbo in it, and, you know, a mess of health insurance we want. I didn't I didn't have health insurance my entire 20s. My entire 20s, I had health insurance for one year, oh. and that was it. And that was the 29, because I was married. Hmm. So I just didn't need health insurance, and it never was a problem. I never got in an accident. It was a gamble, but... You know what? Even if I had health insurance, I didn't have money to pay for shit, so it wouldn't matter. So I would have just sent them a dollar a year or whatever you do. So like it just it just wasn't something that I needed and it wasn't a product that I needed and like I, I 26 million people just aren't aren't going to buy something they don't want or need or, or or can't afford now because prices are artificially inflated because the government got involved. Well, yeah, and the government's involved in a whole bunch of different stuff about medical care. A lot of the minutiae stuff that most people do not see, like there's the usual stuff on like these are regulation, but the one regulation most people don't know about um, hospitals is the is the need clause of hospitals. So as you see, everything gets built for you know, like there's a Starbucks on freaking every corner. There's gas stations everywhere. You can't do that with hospitals. You right. have to see it. They have to determine a need for a hospital. If you need another uh, uh, Niku in somewhere, or you need another emergency room area. What is a Niku? Is this one of your Pikamons? Uh, Niku is a neonatal intensive care unit. Oh, uh, that's different than one of your little Pokemons? It's slightly different. All right. I've got to actually go back there and bring Gunther back up there. How's Gunther doing? Gunther's doing good. Um, Gunther's not sleeping all the way through the night because I believe Gunther's maybe starting to tease because Gunther has bouts of inconsolable rage. Uh, okay. Which uh, that's, uh, was up late last <laughs> night because... Of, get that get that from Lacey or... Yeah, yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> I, 
I sleep like a, you know, I sleep like a log. So I'm guessing that's where that comes from. But right. uh, yeah, but no, no, Gunther's doing great. And luckily, uh, I live in an area where the Niku's close because the need is for that area that we have that that close to our house. So it's easy. But it's a lot of the hospital, like, uh, it's that's another reason why the hospitals cost so much is because there's a need. There's not multiple hospitals also vying for competition because they're technically our businesses. So if you have, you know, competing hospitals to send someone through, through you know, you can watch prices change. And that right. also helps workers because even EMT workers don't get paid that much. They barely get paid $15 an hour. But if another hospital strand up and started paying their EMTs $25 an hour, it'll help the, the you know, you get the, be- the better EMTs. MTs will go to that one, will help competition that way. So essentially these block – so what happens is they're going to repeal that, and what they're going to do is they're going to take take away all federal involvement in the in any of the exchanges and all that stuff, and they're just going to provide the funding sources for it. And they're going to put all the responsibility into the states, and the states are then responsible for – they have to administer exchanges. They still have to – it's basically 50 state Medicare expansion instead of 31, mm-hmm. and then the federal government will will provide block grants, which means here's just a big chunk of money. And Rand Paul is objecting, saying that is not what we promised, and we we promised to repeal, mm-hmm. and uh, you need to do what you're what you're going to say you're going to do. Uh, so. Essentially, what Rand Paul to to get he started tweeting, uh, and his Twitter has been very active lately. Definitely somebody that you want to follow because he's making news. Um, the block grant design. This is from Reason Magazine. This is an article by Peter Sudeman on September nineteenth, uh, called "The GOP's New Health New Obamacare Repeal Bill Shouldn't Pass. It Might Anyway," and it details a lot of what Rand Paul is talking about. Um, and he basically, uh, the bill's block grant formula, Paul says, would redistribute federal money from blue states to red states because it spreads out the money that is now used to fund Obamacare's Medicaid expansion, which only 31 states participate in, to every state. Essentially, it would take money away from the states that expanded Medicaid under Obamacare and give it to more states that didn't. More states equals more cost, essentially. So we're going from 31 to 50. So the cost of funding 31 states will now be 50 states. Imagine what that will do to the deficit. It is relevant that Paul's home state of Kentucky was one of the states to expand Medicaid, perhaps. But Paul's – so basically what Suderman is saying is, is it interesting that Kentucky, his home state, expanded Medicaid? And now he's kind of sticking up for them? Maybe, but this is not a surprise for Paul. Yeah. Um, it just – Paul said – uh, to Slate Magazine, of all places. It just looks like the Republicans are taking the money from Democrat states and giving it to Republican states. And he goes on, his worries about the arcane future policy battles the system would set up are worth considering. So we're going to go through year after year of Republicans fighting Democrats over the formula. It's hardly clear that Graham Casty would result in stable policy or political equilibrium. The bill then doesn't really solve any of the problems that have kept the previous iterations of Obamacare repeal from passing, yet Senate Republicans, looking through the prism of months of frustration and failure, might pass it anyways for one reason. This is their final shot, and they promised they would. Uh, So, and he gave a timeline. Let me look up the timeline. But obviously this is is a bill, Harry, that libertarians would be completely opposed, the Graham-Cassidy bill. Yes. Oh, you want to yeah, I want you to pad. That's that was me saying, Harry. Why don't you talk for a second while I look this up gracefully? Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll try to catch better in the next time. <laughs> That's okay. There's. <laughs> let me just say, uh, they have a strict deadline. I yeah. found it, Harry. You don't need to pad. It's fine. After September 30th, the procedural vehicle that allows Senate Republicans to pass a health care bill with a simple majority vote expires. This means they have less than two weeks to make good on their promise to repeal and replace their health care law. The health care law. In other words, this is their last chance. They might take it. They've got a list of holdouts like Senator Collins and Murkowski from Maine and Alaska, respectively. You had John McCain casting a deciding vote against the repeal. Uh, Then you had uh, Senator John Kennedy from uh, Louisiana, who's part, you know, a counterpart to the sponsor of this bill. Mm -hmm. John McCain's a bestie with Lindsey Graham. And Lindsey Graham today in a press conference kind of gave a wink and a nod asking if John McCain would support his bill. And so people are chattering that maybe he will. So obviously something we need to watch because it's going to be a hot topic of debate. Yeah, and historic. The simple fact that to watch a uh, 
uh, government program get repealed and get you know pushed back. Exactly right. You know, it's I've never seen it, so it's just gonna <laughs> it's gonna blow my mind to even watch it happen. Right. You know. So we'll we'll, I, we'll see what happens, but it's a crucial deadline that we've got here in the next two weeks. Let's move on to our next story, which is the St. Louis riots uh, in St. Louis. The, you might have only heard about the rioting that's going on in St. Louis, unless you're a news watcher, uh, because things like Mike Berg Biglia and some other concerts, like I, I don't think that was the Rolling Stones. That was because of my joke that the Hells Angels should sponsor security at some of these concerts that got canceled. But uh, concerts got canceled in uh, St. Louis because they couldn't provide security because police are dealing with protests. Correct. Uh, so this started Friday night in St. Louis. We are recording this on Tuesday, and uh, there were 100 people arrested in St. Louis today. And they are um, – they had 23 people as of 6 p.m. on Friday night. This is an older article, but it – essentially the violence began because uh, – they had peaceful demonstrations that day because a judge acquitted former St. Louis police officer Jason Stockley for killing Anthony Lamar Smith in December of 2011. Mm -hmm. In a court document, this is from the Washington Post, submitted by the St. Louis Circuit Attorney, the investigator on the case said Stockley and another officer had been chasing Smith at speeds up to 80 miles per hour when Stockley said he was going to kill this motherfucker, don't you know it, and told the officer to drive into Smith's slowing car. The document said Stockley then approached Smith's window and fired five times into the car, hitting Smith, Smith with each shot and killing him. In addition, prosecutors accused the officer of planting a gun on the victim. There was a gun found in Smith's car, but it was later determined to have DNA only from the police officer, Stockley. Judge Timothy Wilson, the circuit judge who heard the case in a bench trial, acquitted Stockley on the murder charge as well as a charge of armed criminal action in a 30-page order released 30 morning. Wilson wrote that he was simply not firmly convinced of Stockley's guilt, saying that agonizingly he went over the case's evidence repeatedly. Uh, and he was not convinced that the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Stockley did not act in self-defense. Um, so... <laughs> but being on tape of giving, like, the uh, was the intent is murder, <laughs> he, he wanted to intend. He, he's like, I'm going to do this. Uh, right. And he, had, had had you been in in the opposite role, yeah. Let's right. say a human let's to say, human, yeah. Non police officer to non other police officer, yeah. 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 On tape saying I'm going to murder somebody and then actually shoot this person. You know, you're going away for murder. Ram them with your car and then walk up and shoot them with a uh, with a gun. It doesn't matter. You yeah. can't say that's self defense. Yeah, that's not self. Yeah, that's not self defense. Mm -hmm. And it, it's. And what reasonable expectation did the police officer have that he was going to be shot at by Smith? He didn't know he had a gun in the car. Correct. They just threatened that he did. Uh, granted, you know, could he not have been? Could this have been prevented from not running? Yes, totally. Could have been totally different right. if he didn't run. But just because you run does not give you the uh, permission to get, to shoot shoot and kill somebody. Yep. Just be, uh, there's tons of different castle doctrine laws that if you shot someone fleeing your house. You know, you would be in trouble for for doing it as, uh, as as just a regular person. That's the main reason why people are upset about this because any other person not wearing that funny costume, you know, they would be behind bars right now, or at least be sued incredibly civilly by the fa family. And it, the, uh, and the spe and speculation. The other thing with the gun planting thing, I don't know about anyone. Maybe there's more stuff that wasn't released to the public, but I've got more fingerprints than just mine on my gun. That's the thing. Always says like, well, just his fingerprints were found. That sounds the most biggest BS because most people, you know, most people's guns have tons of different people fingerprints on it. Yeah, you know, I, you know, like, great. Uh, I've got Chris's fingerprints on my gun. He doesn't know how he's got it on there, but his fingerprints are on mine. Make you're, sure about that. You're a fucking creep, Harry. <laughs> uh, and we should mention also that Ferguson is in St. Louis. Yes. St. Louis. I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's in St. Louis. And in 2014, obviously, that, that's you know where you had the Michael Brown incident, and then you had the Ferguson riots. Yes. And so you have a very strong network of anti-police protesters. Right. And they've done nothing to really to – they've done very little to try to bridge that gap between those and those – since the Michael Brown protest, right, and it's and watching the FBI come down and go after this because the, the, the police response is usually like very chaotic on these, so and, and, and escalating, and it just shows like the 
and it also gives, and this whole case gives almost backdrop to why everyone was so pissed off at the Michael Brown case because of stuff like this, you know. This per- and the other thing with that cop, he also also had a, what was it? Was that one report that he didn't have? He had another gun on him that he wasn't supposed to have by policy. I didn't. I didn't read that. But yeah, I read a report. It could have been wrong. Could have been false. I only saw it in two different places that he had like apparently a pistol. Uh, uh one of those uh, sawed on AK forty seven pistols on him. It's cool. But who knows? It always came from a liberal press, so it could have been, you know. But that's what I've read from that. Uh, and the whole statement that he had was very that very clinical statement. Like, I drew my police-issued uh, firearm, and right. I shot at this person. Which, you know, it's, come on, you just hit this guy with a car, and I thought he was reaching. He just got, dis- he's dazed, disordered it, and, and, you know, from being hit with a car. Yeah. Come on. He's not following commands. Right, he's not obeying. Yeah. Uh. Which, like, it frustrates me, though all heck about these all the police things is because they expect this type of uh, like uh, calmness and stuff from obedience from, obedience yeah. from pe- from people and you know it's like well I feared for my life it's like you know how many third shift gas station attendants fear for their life every day watching someone come into there with a hoodie sunglasses on and a hat and d- you know this third you know this third shifter doesn't shoot these people coming that's, in? well that's you know that's part of the argument is why do police officers are, why are they granted the right to come home at the end of the day when you don't have the right, right at the end of the day to come home from driving around right, yeah. while police are exist mm-hmm. and you're black. But also that, you know, uh, I don't have a dangerous job, but yeah. like a coal miner, we do our best, but at the same time, we're not violating rights. You, to, you don't have a dangerous job. I, well, you're paranoid for me. Yeah. Yeah. Harry's chief paranoia officer here at We Are Libertarians. <laughs> he was like, uh, every time we do a... Every time we do, every time we do a podcast, you need to call the police and you just say we're live streaming. So don't have a SWAT because the SWAT teams go and break into houses on live streams because the internet thinks it's funny. I'm like, I'm not going. To, I'll be. They'll think I'm crazy. Okay. You don't need to do it for every episode. You just need to do it. Okay. So if something happens, they know to call you. But I would immediately mark me down as a suspicious person. Like maybe I should go SWAT their house. No, they're just going to know if they get a call to probably call you first. Yeah. Well, it's just something you should put. If you're on YouTube, you're Twitch, you're doing something like that, you should probably put a file in just so, so they know, like, hey, this person does stuff online. Call first. But, yeah, but it's it, it's just that, you know, it's, that, it, it's okay to be paranoid for certain things because things just pop up. But as, it's, as my boss, a, at my, as my boss but, at the day job says, there's somebody laying on a concrete slab right now that wasn't paranoid enough. Yeah. The, well, that's the other thing is like, uh, if you're telling me like someone couldn't get uh, ticked off at one of, at, at your boss, you know, you know, break in and come after you, and he, you tell me he would not use you as a human shield to get to his car. <laughs> oh no, we <laughs> Spangle, we save me. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. We have security and we have cameras, and I have cameras here. I mean, so you know, I do. I do recognize that having a lot of equipment and mm-hmm. also high profile personalities. Yeah. You know, at the day job, mm-hmm. but also a lot of equipment here in my place. I have to have twenty four seven streaming security, and even if that means that you hack into my camera and see me naked, that's you know, yeah. that's, that's what you gotta do. you're gonna regret it, but <laughs> you do. So, uh, so yes, another another little before we move on from the story, one other thing. We won't get into the the looting and the. There's been a bunch of looting and there's been a bunch of yeah. marches, and you can go look at all that stuff up. But I think people don't understand why it was happening, and I think uh, people need to hear the underlying story. Yeah. Uh, but the St. Louis pol- the St. Louis police are investigating whether or not some of its officers chanted "Whose streets? Our streets!" during protest over the acquittal of a white former policeman who shot a black man to death in 2011. This is uh, from Reuters. Uh, so, and basically, 120 people were, less, were arrested late Sunday when police in riot gear used pepper spray and detained activists who defied orders to disperse following larger peaceful protests. As St. Louis Post Dispatch, the big paper in St. Louis, photojournalist, uh, a St. Uh, di- Post Dispatch, a photojournalist, uh, t- <laughs> David Carson, tweeted that he and others heard some officers chant whose streets are streets, commandeering a refrain used by the protesters themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, grainy video circulating online shows a group of officers and the chant can be heard. So, it, you know, your, your job as a police officer is to secure the streets. You're not there to make a political statement in that moment, and uh, that that's what they were trying to do. So 
the, the uh, they'll be investigated and absolutely nothing will happen to them. So <laughs> yeah, we investigated ourselves and we have cleared ourselves from all wrongdoing. <laughs> right. But <laughs> everybody else wish they could do that with their jobs. <laughs> um. So the next story is is the story about the story is more interesting <laughs> than, than the actual story. Uh, so let me explain what was happening. Trump, yeah, photo. yeah, Trump lawyers clash over how much to cooperate with Russia inquiry. Now, this was a September 17th story from the New York Times by Peter Baker and Kenneth Vogel, and essentially his legal team was is wrestling with how much to cooperate with the special counsel looking into Russian election interference, an internal debate that led to ang an angry confrontation last week between two White House lawyers, and that could shape the course of the investigation. Uh, one more paragraph. At the heart of the class, it, clash is an issue that has challenged multiple presidents during high-stakes Washington investigations. How to handle the demands of investigators without surrendering, surrendering the institutional prerogatives of the office of the presidency. So, in short, uh, the debate has pitted Mr. Trump's West Wing. Uh, Donald McGahn is the White House counsel. So he is the official lawyer for the White House, the executive branch. And uh, that has pitted him against Ty Cobb, a lawyer brought in to manage the response to the investigation. Mr. Cobb has argued for turning over as many of the emails and documents requested by the special counsel as possible in hopes of quickly ending the investigation. Mr. McGahn supports cooperation, but has expressed worry about setting a precedent that would weaken the White House long after Trump's tenure is over. So Ty Cobb, who has this weird little curly roly-poly mustache and mm -hmm. claims to be a, a relative of the, the Ty Cobb, virulent racist and horrible drunk who beat his wife, baseball player Ty Cobb. Yeah. Um, 22 seasons of the Detroit Tigers. Right. Ty Cobb. Uh, Ty Cobb. Uh, but anyways, this lawyer was brought in to be the media lawyer and handle some of the media stuff, but also to be on Trump's personal team. And uh, he wants to turn over as many documents as possible just to get this all clear. Because he's like, listen, we've got all these documents, including documents that are, are allegedly in McGahn's safe, which any lawyer has documents in a safe. OK, if you know a lawyer, they have documents in a safe because those documents prove the innocence of their clients. Mm -hmm. They haven't gone to trial yet, so they put them in the safe so they don't nothing happens to them to make sure their clients don't go to jail forever. Like, don't let that little fact throw you off into conspiracy land. So – and he's arguing with McGahn, who, whose job it is as the White House counsel to protect presidential privilege, essentially. Correct, yeah. You know, because there's, there's always a balance between the presidency and, and the person, okay? So mm -hmm. as a person, you are, you are given attorney – if Harry were my attorney mm -hmm. and he and I had conversations, that's privileged conversation. He, I am allowed to say things to him that cannot be used in court, and he cannot be forced to testify against me because I told him that I was guilty or whatever. Right. But as the president of the United States, there are things in that attorney-client privilege that are germane to the business of the American people. Mm -hmm. And so there is always a, a tension there. Yeah, correct. You're supposed to have record of all presidential um, – Exactly. Uh, not accounts, but uh, uh, speeches and – because they always put that in the library – this is who the president talked to on this day. Random B, because you can sit there and search for like when Bill Clinton talked to some fourth graders. You can, that right, speech is stenographered. Exactly right. So, <laughs> right, everything is recorded. Um, so, so that is that is what there there there's internal strife happening at the White House around all this, and so. <laughs> So how do we know this information? Because that seems like really sensitive information. Like we know information that Trump's lawyers are talking about. Mm -hmm. Like you don't hear lawyer. Like the first thing they teach you in law school is don't have conversations about clients in any place that could be heard, overheard. Like I used to run the Libertarian Party of Indiana. We were we were like so low on the totem pole. We were trying. We would like hope that the media would steal our secrets you know what i mean like we would we would call up the republican party and go you want to hear any of our secrets they're like nope thanks we're good today and then hang up i still would never put anything in writing yeah. i still would make a phone call to somebody and go here's some secret information that you need to know about mm -hmm. like nothing about ed coleman indianapolis city county councilor switching to the libertarian party was ever in writing until it actually happened and that is because it was 
a huge piece of news for not just local the local party but the national party Good. and it could there were a lot of sensitive you know you might lose the deal if people get wind of that so here little old dumb me especially little old dumb 26 year old me is not putting things in writing or having conversations in front of reporters and is very careful about what he says to whom mm -hmm. why is the why, why are the lawyers not so <laughs> kenneth kenneth vogel is a reporter at the washington bureau of the new york times and he was and this is in the Times Insider, but it's a public article. On September 19th, the the article is titled, Isn't That the Trump Lawyer? A Reporter's Accidental Scoop. And uh, th this New York Times reporter goes to a place called BLT Steak, mm -hmm. which is the same block as the New York Times Washington Bureau. Uh, and <laughs> he meets a source there. And he and the source are having lunch there, and they're they're talking when the source says to Vogel, hey, isn't that the Trump lawyer? Because of the curly mustache, he recognized him. Mm -hmm. He turns around, and he's like, oh, man. So Vogel starts zoning out on the conversation with the source and listening to what they're talking about. Lunch ends. The source says, hey, you want to walk together because we're headed the same way? And Vogel says, I'm going to have another tea. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to sit here for a while. And he starts to listen in, and he just starts, like, he sits there for, like, another hour thinking there's no way these guys, like, aren't going to realize it's me. People kept coming up because he was on the sidewalk because these guys were outside, okay? They were on the sidewalk. Open you know, air, yeah. Open <laughs> like, air, outside. You could easily walk to the White House. Mm -hmm. You're within the same block of the New York Times. And they're outside having a conversation about one of the most secret, sensitive investigations in the history of American politics. And a New York Times reporter is sitting there listening. And people kept coming up and, and saying hi to Vogel, <laughs> including Maggie Haberman, the White House. Maggie Haberman's like this pretty young woman. She's the White House correspondent for the New York Times. Everybody in Washington knows who she is. Mm -hmm. you know. And he's just like, he said he was sitting there making the the... Nick's like, get out of here. <laughs> like, and, and nobody, like, and so they finally did. Goes back, talks to his editors, and then they have a conversation uh, and they write this article. Uh, really just a very weird, interesting uh, story. I, I mean, and it just shows you at every turn, Trump hurts himself, right. and, and everyone around him just seems to be incompetent and stupid, and it starts at the top. Yeah, it's either they're incompetent or stupid because you want to believe, like, this is an elaborate, you know, like, 8D chess move. Like, right. You tell them, like, hey, they're going to be here at this restaurant. Just go there, openly talk about this. Okay? Right. You know? This way we can control the news cycle about this supposed leak. Right. That, but this this only shows me, like, maybe all the leaks are just incompetent moves. <laughs> yeah. Every leak is just someone being incompetent, sitting out somewhere, talking about something. Having covered and worked... And all sides of politics over the last 15 years, Harry, mm -hmm. I've worked in politics, around politics, covered politics. I can tell you that conspiracies are just dumb people doing dumb things, and then we assign conspiratorial motives. The government, at the very end of the day, is incompetent and stupid, mm -hmm. and that sometimes, as our friend Abdul says, a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> you know, and... Are are there things that are conspiratorial? Like, is there a network called the deep state? Absolutely. Yes. You know. Yes. Do I think John Kennedy was assassinated? Absolutely by the CIA. I do believe in some conspiracies. I think he was killed by the CIA. I do. Okay. But at the end of the day, Shadi was killed with a magic bullet forged by Illuminati mystics. <laughs> Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and the government, even at the very highest levels is run by incredibly stupid people. So, uh we're so we're out of time for this episode, yeah. but we still have one of the the hottest topics that people want us to discuss. And so what I'm going to do is be annoying and I'm going to put that as our bonus segment okay. for our Patreon subscribers. So every week we're going to give you an extra segment of the show and you get to hear a bonus segment so you get even more content. So if you're somebody that just can't get enough of what we're doing, well have Fear not. Okay, Dear Leader is thorough and, and generous and thorough. 
and provides you with a bonus segment. So Harry and I are going to talk about Facebook and what responsibility social networks uh, bear to the American people. And they did an internal audit and found that 472 different uh, accounts in Russia had purchased $100,000 worth of Facebook ads. And we're going to we're gonna dive into this a little bit and talk about the conversation that's going on. We're also going to have Harry's tech tip, uh, what I have learned since we stepped up and started doing the second show, how much people love Harry and they love his technology and they want a little they just want to play the tip. Just the just, tip. Just the tip. Just, just the, the tip, tip with Harry's they don't want to go full immersed into Harry's tech world because they can't handle that. So we're gonna give you just a tip. Uh, normally that will be in the show, but we're we're out of time. We said an hour, we're gonna stick to around an hour for this uh, for mm-hmm. the Tuesday show. But uh, we're gonna put this in the bonus. Now if you want to hear it. You go to WeAreLibertarians.com, and on the right, there's a little button that says Patreon. You click that button. You sign up for $5 more, $5 or more a month. Mm-hmm. You'll get a private RSS feed that you can then go and put that into your podcatcher and listen. So it's just like a regular podcast. It's super easy, and you get uh, you get not only the show, you get the bonus episodes, you get other audio including the first episode that I the, the first radio broadcast I ever did in 2005 I put in there you can hear Joe Ruiz ask a dirty question to Jolie Borowski you put that in there it's in there oh, that's premium you guys got to hear that that's, it's in there that's, that's super rare you get uh, you get uh, high quality audio it's not that our audio quality isn't good on the main feed that you're probably listening to it's just that I bump up the quality and make the file size a little bit bigger so you can hear uh, Harry's do- very uh, soothing tones mm. and uh, my my nasally little voice. Uh, and uh, and we get all the commercials, and there's a little – I leave I, we start the recorder a little early, and I leave all that in there. So, for instance, you could have heard me getting attacked by a spider. The audio of that is in there for the bonus. For the, so and he if squealed. Five bucks a month, and what that does is that helps us build the empire, build the wall, as some of you people are saying, and uh, give us the ability to, like I'm looking at hiring a couple people uh, on a freelance basis. So what that's going to allow me to do is I just am at my bandwidth. I can't do anymore, but I know that we need to do X, Y, and Z, so I'm going to use that money to hire people. I'm going to create some jobs and uh, give you more content as a result. So there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. If you're listening to this show for free, keep listening for free. We love you. We appreciate you listening. But if you want to go a little bit extra and you want to get a little bit more, then become a Patreon subscriber. So thank you for listening to this episode. Harry, any final thoughts? Uh, I'll just say once again, thank you for all the Patreon uh, donators. Uh, thank you for helping out. Uh, it helped, takes a huge load out of Chris to help him with that part of page, uh, that part of the show. Uh, thank you for everyone who uh, gets into the uh, Dear Leaders uh, Chambers. I thank you uh, in the, the Facebook group and having conversations go through there and bring up different questions and even help us out with, even with topics because a lot of the stuff that were posted there, like, dude, I've got, I want to talk about it. And for those in the Discord chat, you can even hear me rant about some of the stuff when I'm playing video games. So yeah. yeah. So on, uh, I have promised to thank everybody ten dollars a month and up. We're not going to do that every episode because that's it's starting to get a long list, but I don't know all the new people. So what I'm going to do this week is on this show, I'm going to thank the $100 and $25 a month subscribers. And then on the Thursday show, I'll thank all the $10 people. And then from there on out, we'll thank each person as they sign up. Okay. So that way people aren't, you know, we want to honor people and we want to thank them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we, you know, hopefully it gets so long that we're not sitting here for an hour reading names. I mean, I would love that, but I don't know that the listeners will. What do you think? I think they might, especially if we put like uh, make Jeff Vibber do it and just squirt him with water and make <laughs> him read. Well, I do. I do want to read uh, the hundred dollar a month donors in every episode. I'm I'm sure I will forget Christy, Craig, Jason. You guys know how forgetful I am. Uh, but Christy Avery, Craig DaCosta, and Jason Doolittle, you guys donate a hundred dollars a month. We thank you so much. That's really awesome of you guys. Uh, our $25 a month, folks, Harry's going to sign some posters tonight. We'll have those out to you. You get two posters, one of them autographed. We'll have those out soon. Uh, Brandon Kester, if I say your name wrong, please correct me. 
Brandon Kester, Andre Myrick, Brantley Spicer, Joey Tarner, Heidi Aldridge, Kristen Emmons, Dan Dunbar, Doug Stream, Chad Oakage, Chris, uh, he didn't want his last name in there, I don't think, Christopher Brokoff, and uh, Todd Singer. Thank you guys for your $25 a month contribution. You guys are going to get your poster. Uh, Greg is working on the database of memes. We're working on a store. We've got some shirt ideas that we're working on. So you guys are all so good to us, and we thank you so much for doing that. Harry, we're going we're gonna to say goodbye to our, our free listeners. We're going to hit the pause button, but then we're going to jump right back in. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Everybody else listening, we will see you soon, and we hope that you will sign up so you can hear the rest of the show. Mm -hmm. And we will see you. Uh, we have a catchphrase. We have a sign-off. Do we? We do. About, you know, who will... Greg. Yeah, yeah right. I okay. Know, I know. All right. So, yeah. so for uh, for how do I set it up again? I don't remember. So <laughs> as of now, <laughs> Greg will be back Thursday. There you go. Oops, I should have just kept that running. Okay. Let me just get yeah. a drink of water and blow my nose. Okay. See you everyone on the other side. See you on the other <sighs> side. I I I scheduled a personal training session. For, need for this show? 5.30, what? It's a show crowd. <sighs> Not to keep us, like, like for commercials, just to sit here going like. I've looked <laughs> at various show clocks. Show clocks are like hundreds of dollars because no. I've looked at it. That's why no. I have this clock here. You, you know why? Tech figure. Uh, well, you figure it out. And we'll well, I need it, a space. I have a. That's my other problem. Like, I could do that with a, that's a, I could just use Linux and make something like that because it's a simple math. Yeah, I want to keep it around an hour. Because it's not like you don't need a – because we can set it up so like – because you can almost just use like a big gin clock. Mm -hmm. you go get your cutter. Cause you can do like well, I mean there's a giant clock on the wall there, Harry, and then That's, I've got the No, I want something timer. like sitting in front of my face, you know, almost like set it up like as laps, and then we can like hit a click on it and like put the segments up, which –